Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here today. It's great to be back doing these events again after, after so much time uh, without the travel and what have you. So really, really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so, and also, you know, hearing some fantastic news already, uh, you know, with the, the keynotes from already from this morning. I think, you know, what Dave spoke about in terms of uh, Cloud V1 uh, and then Cloud V2 was really interesting to reflect back on our journey at Deutsche Bank, uh, you know, and, and try and consider where, where do we think we are on that journey, uh, you know, and perhaps, you know, you can decide when, after you've heard our story. Uh, but I think we've done a reasonable job so far. Um, yeah, so what we'll be doing today is sharing some insight in that journey. Um, how we kind of started with, you know, very, very little at all uh, uh, and had a very, very constrained target and timeline to bring our application teams on board, get them into Google Cloud as, as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Jeremy Crawford. I'm the uh, head of cloud product at Deutsche Bank. Hey, morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Thomas Chalmers. So I'm more from an engineering perspective, um, and I've helped engineer the TFEs that we've got uh, within Deutsche Bank. Cool. So with that, um, let's start with a bit of history, a bit of context as to where we are. Um, our team formed back in April 2020. So this is the height of the pandemic, probably a time not many of you want to remember. Um, but it was, a, it was an interesting challenge because, you know, we were, we were scattered around the world. None of us had really met in person. We didn't really have that um, psychological trust that you might have in a, in a pre-existing team. So anyway, we formed together. Um, and and we, we, we were from the same Well, we had a before. previous team, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. So myself and Jeremy were were from a previous platform team. So we had some of um, the sort of transferable skills or so we thought to go into the cloud, but none of us really had um, a deep understanding of any cloud technologies. And with that, neither of us really knew Terraform either. Um, so we, you know, we had this announcement that was then later made um, as to the bank was going to use Google Cloud and in GCP quite heavily. And so that was announced, but it asked the question for us, well, what do we do next? How can we actually leverage GCP? Um, we knew the sort of the end state. A lot of people wanted to use GCP, but what's that middle ground? What frameworks or what tools are out there um, that we can maybe leverage and use to allow teams to get on there safely? So with that in mind, that was a sort of starting point for our journey. Yes, I mean, reflecting back on that time, it was uh, quite a daunting uh, position to be in. As Tom said, you know, height the pandemic, we just formed this this new team and. With a mix of skills, some of us had platform experience, some of us had uh, a little bit of cloud before, a bit of Azure, a bit of AWS. Um, and we didn't actually know. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the announcement was made uh, quite soon after that, that formation of the team. But for the first few weeks, we still didn't know if we were going to be going with Google or, or, or Azure. And, uh, and then well, what we did know is that as soon as that announcement was made, the, the hordes were waiting at the gate, right? They, they, they were. They wanted to get in as quickly as possible. So we were under quite a lot of pressure, you know. Um, and really, you know, just to kind of the anecdote about where we started from, we really did start from zero. So there was a, um, you know, as soon as the, the decision was made, we're going with, with Google. Uh, one of the first tasks was to, 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 to grab the domain db.com. Very, very important to the bank to, to have that. Turns out that uh, 10 years prior, Deutsche had already done a, a, a POC with Gmail, uh, and um, you know the, the the all of the people that had been involved with that they were you know there were some super admins, um, and they'd all gone AWOL, right? <laughs> uh, well, they'd actually most of them had actually left to be clear, uh, and there was one uh, uh, engineer remaining who suddenly became he was standing between this ten-year partnership and us unleashing db.com, uh, who, who happened to still be in the bank and, and trying to explain to him how he needs to get his password reset and, and he needs to make me the super admin and then I'm going to go and open this thing up and away we go, right? So that's literally, you know, where we were at. Um, and then we knew that we had to, you know, as I said, the hordes were waiting at the, at the gate. We knew that we had to open that gate, but we had to be able to do it safely and we didn't have much time. We had some idea about the kinds of concepts that, that you know, we needed to address, um, you know, principles around automation, blueprints, identity and access management, networking security, you know, all the standard stuff. Um, 
So we had some loose concepts. Uh, but we were still really unsure, you know, as I said, very kind of somewhat naive at this point. We didn't really know how we were going to bring this all together. Um, we did have a team that al had already been doing some of this stuff already, you know, with basic kind of what looked like a standardized approach with, with GitLab, with open source Terraform, uh, you know, and, and controlling and, and carving out different aspects of the cloud and managing those with different state files, et cetera. But really, other than that, we, we, you know, we were unsure. Yeah, so with that, uh, with that in mind, we sort of wanted to frame uh, our journey with a couple of core principles from the start. So these are sort of what we established. And I mean, much of these headings probably won't be news to any of you uh, in the audience. But you know, these are things that we sort of wanted to start from the beginning. And then you know, these have proved true throughout the journey. So um, let's just talk through some of these. I mean, in the top left there, we've got everything as code. And we really wanted to emphasize the everything part of that. So you'll be familiar with Terraform as the infrastructure as code. Um, we then sort of discovered and became to start to love uh, Sentinel. And that's policy as code for us. And then also documentation as code. Um, and obviously, I don't need to really label the point of why that's important. But for us, it was then tying into automation, which you see on the right. And only with the everything as code principle could we really get the value of, of automation. Through automation, we could then have scale, and we, we didn't have this problem of toil of you know engineers manually deploying things that, that weren't in um, an appropriate code base. So everything is code, automa automation, very tightly coupled. Then obviously we're a, we're a bank, a financial institution. Uh, we've got some regulation we need to you know adhere to. So we have this governance aspect. Um, again, that sort of overlapped to it with Sentinel, or we saw Sentinel um, prove its weight in, in trying to do that. But we weren't really sure how we could achieve that at scale. Um, so anyway, with those three principles, the fourth being federation. So throughout all of this, we were quite a small team. Um, the skills gap is, is something you're all aware of. So we wanted to do this in quite a pragmatic way. Um, and we, we chose to sort of federate out uh, modules, or Terraform modules, to allow us to really scale and reuse you know, problems that have been solved once, multiple times to the rest of the org. So yeah, with that in mind, um, we then you know, started further on the journey. And, and the federation bit was really around getting out of the way. We didn't want application teams to feel as if we were the bottleneck to them. Um, and actually, there, there wasn't this centralized infrastructure pool. We wanted to disperse this to all app teams um, from across the bank. They can deploy infrastructure how they see fit. And I think this was a big paradigm shift compared to sort of on-premise world of teams waiting a long period of time for specific infrastructure. They now had the ability to you know, scale this as they see fit. So yeah, huge paradigm shift. Yeah, may maybe what else was shifting there as well was looking at what it, what it is that we're going to be handing over in terms of you know, building this platform. Um, you know, and maybe this is a sort of more of a cloud v1 piece, right? But mm. we had seen, or at least you know, I'd seen previously other enterprises going through this journey. You know, and, and at the far end of the scale, they're just just serially making individual services available one by one, using central infrastructure teams where the actual consumers were were kept away from the provisioning of that infrastructure. And you know, per these principles, we knew that that wasn't something we wanted to offer. You know, if the platform was Google Cloud Platform, that's what we want to make available to our consumers. We don't want to be in the way. So you know, we wanted to provide the thinnest wrapper around that. Uh, you know, and and really, you know, adhere to those principles. And the app teams would have to be educated. They'll have to learn all about you know app SRE, looking after their infrastructure, looking after the full stack. Um, so I think that part was clear. Um, and then really, you know, as I said before, we'd already had a, a team. I think this was one of the pioneers that was, was scheduled to go first into the cloud uh, or, you know, on our retail banking side. They'd already done uh, somewhat of a, a POC using, as I said, GitLab, open source Terraform, and what have you. So we knew that, that we needed to use some tooling. We looked, obviously, at the options that were out there. We looked at a couple of open source products as well and started to crystallize, I think, these principles. But there were still, there were still open, open questions. You know, I think we, we knew that if we don't find the right tool, we're still going to be building a lot of this ourselves. And that's going to push the timelines out, time that we didn't have. Right? So we had to find something that's going to help us accelerate. But as I said, the idea was becoming concrete. And you know, we now had a, a real concept on which to build. So uh, as, as I said, we, 
we, we saw some, some tooling out there, some open source tooling. A lot of these tools and ways of working, they made reference to this concept called the landing zone, or a landing zone. <laughs> and I still get asked questions today, you know, what is the landing zone, <laughs> right? And uh, it's never, not always the easiest thing to articulate. So, you know, I'm actually going to go back to the, uh, the military origin of that term, right? Which is all about uh, securing terrain, often, uh, you know, hostile terrain, um, and being able to make rapid, safe landings, uh, getting into that terrain. The steep approach that is the, the tagline to, to this talk uh, is, is a type of landing zone um, where, you know, helicopter typically will approach, uh, and there being a lot of high obstacles, getting into confined areas, maybe the center of a city, very dangerous often in, in hostile areas, very difficult. And, you know, just relating that to the challenge at DB, uh, you know, anyone who works in a, in a financial institution will know there are many, many obstacles that you, you're going to have to overcome. And just the, the sheer weight of, of the program, uh, the timescales, the, the expectations, you know, um, this, this really was uh, going to, to we, we were going to need, we were going to need help, right, to, to, to get in there. So, yeah, I think we had some fundamentals established, right? We did, yeah. So with that framed, I mean, as you can see illustrated on the slide, what we sort of devised of what we thought would be a good concept of a landing zone was to, you know, start with this collection of Git repositories. That was going to be the base level, somewhere to store uh, the infrastructure as code. And then layer on top of that, some execution of the Terraform. So for us, that ended up being Terraform Enterprise Workspaces. But at this point in time, we weren't really too sure what that looked like. But we knew we needed code, we needed somewhere to execute it, and then there's going to be an output. Uh, the output, in the most truest sense, at the beginning was just a Google Cloud folder. Um, which is, you know, your, your biggest um, sort of area that teams can just have out of the box. Uh, and that's what we gave teams the ability to use, coupled with a couple of service accounts. Um, this was sort of the vanilla landing zone out of the box, and then teams are free to go and use uh, that as they see fit. So with those components in mind, um, we thought this provided a, a fairly secure man manner to get to the cloud, um, and one that could, we could do that with velocity and speed. So yeah, this really provided the path into the cloud for a lot of the early teams, um, and then we sort of iterated on this as we went through. Yeah. But it did make the quit. Sorry, go on. No, yeah, I was just, I was just going to say. I mean, th you know, these, and this really was the, the concept. And you know, as I said, there were these tools out there. Terraform Enterprise appeared to be helping out, mm. right? But obviously, I think you know, we needed to, we needed to dig further into that, right? Yeah, and that sort of begged the question. Um, you know, there might be some tool sets out there that can achieve this for us. Is there the option of doing this in open source? And what are the trade-offs that we'd make um, between those decisions? So that ties into this slide. And um, you know, many of you in the audience might be familiar with this picture, where on the left, you've got you know, an organization of quite a scale um, with a lot of sporadic use of open source Terraform or any other language, um, you know, various flavors, various sizes scattered across the organization. And we weren't really at the position where they had that, because as I mentioned, we were new to the cloud as a result fairly new to Terraform as well. But that was a bit of a luxury for us. Uh, we didn't have this problem of you know, technical debt and teams having to look after state file in various different places. What we did see is that you know, with the, um, the enterprise solutions, there was a much more standardized control, not only with a state file, but just you know, how you can scale as a team and collaborate um, on a wider level. So yeah, no scaled OSS usage. Uh, we were then presented with the problem of do we build or buy? So do we provide a wrapper around Terraform as an open source product? Or do we start to evaluate the enterprise uh, solutions in a bit more depth? And we were sort of seeing the value that we might get from some of those enterprise solutions, whether that be a strategic place to execute Terraform, um, managing the state files, as I mentioned, or Sentinel policy, which is really quite unique to TFE. It wasn't really uh, you know, a, a feature you could get in the open source world that easily. So yeah, sporadic versus standardization. That was sort of the point we were at. Yeah, um, and I think. Other than some of the obvious uh, um, capabilities of, you know, fundamentally, we wanted to provide a, a single gate through which everything could flow, right? And I think with the, uh, the build option, it just opens up so many questions about, well, where is that gate, right? And is there one? Uh, you know, yes, you can have your, your Git repos, but how do you sort of police where they are? How do you, uh, like, what controls do you have over wiring, wiring that into your workflow engine? Uh, what about how do, you, how do you control where people might source their modules? 
and and you know and all of that would just was just quite sort of you know scary <laughs> right um we needed somewhere where we could herd the cats basically uh, and have them all flow through this gate once they're out the gate then we have the control right and they and we want to try again back to the philosophy give them as much autonomy once they're inside and and i think you know the, the some of those key features quite clearly as we've already touched on, you know, um, Sentinel, you, you're going through the gate, but we are checkpointing you every time. Um, and we can build, um, we can federate that, we can build communities around policy authoring. You know, it doesn't just have to be the, the central security organization that's, that's writing those, those policies. And that means, you know, we get to inspect everything. And quite clearly, uh, you know, there are other products out there that we looked at, but this being this being HashiCorp's products, quite quite clearly, you're going to be, you know, on top of the curve uh, as new resources, new new providers become uh, defined and available. Then you know there's going to be Sentinel policy uh, ability to to you know to to sort of counter what might, you know, what what we might be allowing and permitting and, and creating with with Terraform. Um, so you know, and I think there were still probably a couple of gaps. Uh, the you know, similarly, the modules, you know, we have to have a single uh, central place where only from this location the modules uh, can be consumed. And the private module registry is, is doing, you know, exactly that. Coupled with Sentinel, we can have policies that say, you know, if you're sourcing, if you're creating this, this type of resource, oh, first of all, if you're creating any resource, you can only use um, modules from, from our private module registry. Um, you know, and and then if you're, um, yeah, if you're if you're creating uh, using uh, a certain type of module, specifically, then you can only use this module. So for this, like for the project resource, you know, which if you use Google, it, that's your kind of base container for all resources. We've already created a mandatory policy that that, that forces you to use uh, our project module, and that way we get to define all the metadata and labels. So you've got the control. But you're also giving the autonomy. You're also allowing, um, you know, federating this out. So we, there's a couple of pieces that were missing from from the product, which again, you know, hearing Armand talk about some of the uh, the new features that are coming is is really really great to hear. But at the time, uh, you know, back end of 2020, we're we're thinking about how do we plug these gaps. So we had uh, we came up with the concept of the module authoring framework providing uh, you know, pipelines for creating modules and ensuring that standard, standard uh, templates are used, ensuring that you know, kitchen tests are authored, and then running that pipeline, creating the module, running all the tests against it. Does it do what you expect it to do? Great, then you could go publish it to the, to the PMR. Likewise, with policy, we, we, we had to create a policy authoring framework. Uh, same same, same uh, principle, right? So author the policy, create some resource, Run the sentinel against it. Run the positive case. Run, run the negative case, and then you know if that all works, we're great. The policy gets published. So, and again, federating that. It doesn't have to be run and, and, and delivered by a central team. If a, if a team wants to come on board and make their uh, new service available and they're the pioneer, then let's have them involved in writing that module, writing those policies. And so, yeah. Um, so I think quite clearly. There were these couple of gaps, but the vast majority of it was being fulfilled. So we, uh, we made the decision, and, and we made the call, and we, we, we got in touch with our account team in the UK and uh, said, look, here's, here's the deal, right? We've got limited time. We need to run with, uh, uh, you know, how can you help us, right? And, and Terraform Cloud Pilot was proposed, and we, we asked, approached it in, in, in that way that, you know, if it all works, and you know, we were hoping, fingers crossed it does, uh, then you know, let's evolve this into into a production solution. We needed a rapid answer. We had again, you know, the hordes at the gate, right? So we had to we had to turn this around quickly. And and you know, credit to the the account team we worked with. That all of that happened really rapidly with some you know fantastic technical support uh, and, and guidance as we uh, as we progressed that. So. Yeah, so with that in mind, um, the TFC pilot was, was sort of born. So for those unfamiliar, the TFC versus TFE, 
uh, is really a SaaS versus PaaS sort of question here. So we started with the, the software offering, um, and that was great because we got to very easily understand the features and benefits um, of the solution without having to have the toil of trying to develop it ourselves. So yeah, we had the TFC pilot, um, immediately saw the value of workspaces. You know, teams can segment their Terraform resources and deployments in a nice controlled way. Don't have to worry about the state files, uh, as we mentioned. And that was really meeting the needs of sort of identity and security to some extent. And then layered below that, we sort of had this central um, PMR, as Jeremy alludes to. This is a great place to store blueprints for teams to you know, move forward. Um, and not only was it the modules, but the providers from, from Google, which was the main one we were using to deploy GCP resources, um, and the tight coupling between you know, Hashi and Google was, was really helpful in that, because every time we were trying to find an API, there was a Terraform resource for it. Um, it's, it's a bad place to be if you discover there's an API and there's not a Terraform resource just yet available. So that was helpful. And there's also the concept of VCS tracking. So um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but basically you've got your Git repo, and there's a nice, easy, and elegant way to link that to automation um, in the Terraform workspace. So every time you push a commit into your Git repo, you're triggering a run um, within TFC. So that was great to see. And that answered the question for automation. So going back to some of the core principles, what was left? Well, that was really security and guardrails. And that was covered off by Sentinel, which was um, yeah a really great Great feature to have and allowed us to build out um, a lot of guardrails very early on. So yeah, we start with the SaaS offering, um, and then we move forward from you, there. You mentioned, so all of those principles, again, going back to that automation, blueprints, security, identity and access. The one area, and I'll be clear on this, that, that, that we need to improve is on the networking side. Um, and I think the way that we had to, to solve that and in fact, the way that we solved some of these other challenges was to, to use the same principles, you know, infrastructure as code and what have you. But the networking piece um, was, I think, you know, we wanted to provide full autonomy. And this is the one area where we were, we were unable to provide full autonomy, autonomy to the app teams. So we had to sort of work with what we'd already devised and, 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 and built those fundamentals. And we came up with a concept of an infrastructure landing zone. And that was basically one that would exist across three uh, uh, GCP organizations and promote across the organizations, but allow the network team to use those same principles, the same policies, guardrails, et cetera, to create the networking resources. Um, you know, and we, we went with a shared VPC model, which I think you know, that has created some difficulties, I'm being honest. Uh, but again, we were also limited to, we're using one of the um, you know, newer uh, cloud providers, and there were some limitations in GCP, right? But nevertheless, what this allowed us to do is to move forward solving the networking question, albeit you know, using this centralized infrastructure landing zone approach. And the infrastructure teams then, the network teams were able to then create those uh, shared VPCs, get them interconnected back to our data centers. And we were doing all of this you know, um, right at the back end of you know, so Q4 2020. So we already had, at this point, established all of those fundamentals um, we had actual resources being created in our production GCP organization uh, within six months of, of starting this journey. Um, and I think by that, at that point, it was quite clear that we'd made the decision to use Terraform Enterprise. Yeah, and as this, this slide sort of illustrates with the dates, I mean, the timings were quite rapid, right? We had, you know, started on this journey in the, in the beginning of 2020. By the tail end, we were doing an MVP with TFC. And then shortly after that, um, we made the decision, like many other large organizations, that perhaps a SaaS offering wasn't um, best suited to our needs. So we made the decision about to, you know, bring TFE um, sort of internal, if you will, and uh, started on the journey to build our own. And as I mentioned, you know, even the team, you know, us within the platform team, we didn't have a great experience of GCP or Terraform to start with. We didn't have those skill sets. So as we were building out TFE as sort of the, the front door for everyone to come and join us on the journey to Terraform, we were exploring that ourselves. So it was a, it was a good challenge to actually even just deploy TFE, which is various different resources, um, and actually get a flavor of consuming this product ourselves. So yeah, we had the, uh, the engineer began for TFE towards the tail end of 2020. We had that up and then sort of migrated off TFC, the workspaces that we did have um, the following year. And then from there, various iterations of TFE have come out, uh, one being active-active. So you know, we're not no longer dependent on a single VM. Uh, you've got some high availability for, for what is a critical platform for us. And yeah, the end state today, we've obviously got multiple production environments um, that teams can deploy to. Cool, so following on from that, um, you know, what does it look like now? What's the state 
And we're not quite at the end, we're, we're still very much getting going, but uh, this, is, this is to sort of reflect on how far we've come in a short period. So um, looking on the right, you've got the count of runs within TFE. So runs that aren't familiar is really a metric for how much you're sweating the workspaces. So it's great having lots of areas carved out for teams, but how well are they actually using it? You know, how many runs are they doing a day? That was a metric we thought was useful. So we've hit over 250,000 Terraform runs now. So whether that be a plan or an apply, um, the vast majority are plans because teams are iterating, reviewing the plan, is this what they want, and then obviously moving forward uh, to do the apply. Um, and as coupled with that, there's, there's 350 Sentinel policies. So every time those plans are running, there's 350 guardrails in place to check that teams are deploying things in, in, a, in a manner we see fit. So yeah, we started obviously uh, at the beginning with this MVP, the Sentinel policies were in this dev advisory mode, as they call it. Um, and as we progressed, these gradually hardened to become hard mandatory in production, as you might expect. So we give teams a little bit of uh, a flavor of what it's going to be like when they promote their code up to prod, so allow them to adjust accordingly. So yeah, hopefully all this growth is, is interesting from a developer perspective, or it certainly was within the organization, because it allowed teams to be you know, productive. They, they didn't have to worry about how they could deploy the infrastructure. Yes, they had to get to grips with Terraform, um, but wanted to abstract away you know, as much as possible, while at the same point in time allowing them to use GCP to the full potential. Cool. So as we come to the end of this, let's just revisit a little bit what we did. And you know, I'd like the message that I'd like you to take away is how very much Terraform Enterprise enabled our journey and accelerated our journey. So we went from you know, formation of a team uh, to conducting a pilot in summer 2020. Within six months, we created our first infrastructure landing zone with minimum guardrails in place, with a module factory, with a policy factory. Um, and three months subsequent to that, we then had the door, we opened the gate, and, and the, the hordes, you know, we were, we, had, we were keeping them back all the way through 2021 as we started to onboard more and more app teams onto the landing zone. Throughout that year, we then, and, and again, very, very key to this is the Sentinel aspect, giving our security organization the, the confidence that we can unleash the cloud, right, and get that acceleration in place because we can start with a minimum set of guardrails we can add to those guardrails as we go through dev. We can add more services frequently as we go through dev. We can federate. We can use uh, you know, application teams to you know, open source or inner source that within the company uh, to, to help with the module authoring, with the policy authoring. And we can then gradually tighten the screw as we move towards production throughout 2021. Um, and, and, you know, and that gave very much our, our security team is all about that, that confidence uh, that they ultimately can control. You know, they, can, they can turn off or they can enable at their discretion. Right? Um, so the hard enforcement coming in in production on all of these policies and the app teams having to adjust to that, but understanding the reasons why um, and happy to take that on board themselves. Getting into production at the back end of, of 2021, going into 2022, with another wave of onboarding and more and more landing zones being onboarded, over 200 plus landing zones now operational, 200 app teams landing safely in GCP, the steep approach accomplished, rescued the, uh, the last known survivor from the DB.com organization, uh, unleashing the cloud for DB, and avoiding a lot of the common obstacles and pitfalls faced by many large organizations when they typically do their their V1, right? Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it from us. I hope you enjoyed that talk and you got something out of it. Uh, we are able to take questions uh, on, a, on a personal basis. Uh, we'll be around, myself and Tom here. We're here for the duration, um, you know, and, and you can come up to us. We'll be happy to answer, answer any, any questions you might have. Look forward to meeting with you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.